Hey everyone, it's Rob Ryder. Uh, Sunday, February 28th, 2016. Today, out of SWAT bar flies and free men subjects of King George III and his successors. Uh, using the rule of law. That's what we're going to attempt to see if we can figure out how to do. Uh, yes, King George III and his successors are still here and uh, the bar flies are actually part of his society and they really are big on the rule of law as we'll see and so we should know something about it and uh, how it applies so today is Sunday February 20 2016 and if you can please donate because I have to pay my rent it's just the way she works out sometimes my PayPal account is my daughter's name Ashley Ritlewski at gmail.com and that would be spelled A S H L E Y R Y T L E W S K I at gmail dot com. Or you could just put it in the mail. Uh Robert Ritlewski, that would be me. One zero nine five five fourteen mile road northeast, Rockford, Michigan, four nine three four one. And my email is court of record at AOL dot com. Okay, so uh um what's happening is what's happening is, you know, we have a lot of words that are about the same but they're not quite the same, you know. Groups of words. Such as, you know, is your county called the county of Kent or is it Kent County? I'm sure wherever you live you've heard your county describe both, but only one can be the government, so which one is it? Is it the state of Michigan? Is it Michigan? Is it state of Michigan? Is it territory of Michigan? Right? Is it the United States of America? Is it United States? Is it United States of America? Is it U.S. dot? Is it USA? Which you know what describes what? Because that's kind of important <laughs> that you're describing the proper jurisdiction, especially when you're looking for a remedy. And uh, so here's an example. I mean, you know, what? so what law rules? Because we're going to try to use the rule of law. Well, what law rules? Is it the Noahide Laws? Is it the Magna Carta? Is it the Constitution of the United States? A perfect example of, you know, having to look to see what words are is it right in the preamble where we, the people of the United States, in order to perform, form a more perfect union and on and on and on, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Well, why didn't it say, we the people of the United States of America, for the United States of America? Because United States and United States of America aren't the same thing. United States is an abbreviation for the United States of America, which is the proper name or proper title or, I guess, title's probably the proper uh, the title is probably the proper descriptor um, established in the Articles of Confederation and the very first article where it says that the style of Confederation shall be the United States of America with the being capitalized well when Michigan became a state in 1835 in the very first constitution it was a free and independent state by the style of the state of Michigan so, the state of Michigan goes with the United States of America. State of Michigan goes with United States. There are two different jurisdictions. One jurisdiction is King George III and his successors, and the other one is the Republic. <clears throat> so, here's, here's what Merriam Webster had to say about abbreviation. Somebody had asked a question. Good question. What are the styles? Short forms such as U.S. are common in casual language, and using full name or title is considered more appropriate in formal language. So, for example, politicians giving a formal address will usually, almost always, say the United States of America. Right? That's the proper title. That goes with U.S. and it goes with, as we'll see, with the United States. So, in writing, the full form, the United States of America, United States as a noun and U dot S dot with periods inserted and no spaces as an adjective to describe another noun. 
Finally, the use of abbreviation USA is limited. You will find in some proper nouns, especially named media sources, you know, USA, Today, things like that. But USA doesn't go with the United States of America. It may go with the United States of America, but it doesn't go with the United States of America. I'll show you a better example of that here on something, but you know, this is just the thing about the way the preamble is, just in one document. So we, the people of the United States of America, establish a constitution for the people in the United States of America. They must be guessed. We said, here's your rules. you got to live by. And so they're the ones under the Constitution. Uh, King George III and his successors people are. A little more on that in a second. But I want to, you know, this is, so this is all about attorneys. So let me get back to that real quick. So what are we trying to do with attorneys? Well, here's a typical application for admission to practice as an attorney and counselor of law in the state of New York application for admission questionnaire and right off the bat what's it asked for state name in full first name middle didn't say initial middle name last name yeah middle name see the little thing because it says middle name and then it says hey have you ever used or been known by any other name well what do they put in here so somebody should have put their proper name in block one, first, middle, last. But when you go and look at attorneys, the way they sign paperwork, they use a middle initial. Or some use their first name as an initial, but they don't use their proper name. Well, if they didn't put that other name they're using here in block two, then um, <laughs> basically they lied. Right? So um, they're not... Uh, uh, they're not being honest and we've tried to take this to all sorts of places this this the very true thing because it's just not attorneys it's also all the elected officers and many 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 of the appointed officers and on and on and on and that whole jurisdiction is you know let's just call it the middle middle initial jurisdiction that's all under King George III and his successors and it goes all the way up to the justices of the Supreme Court. They're all using middle initials. So the justices of the Supreme Court are over everybody who lives by a middle initial. That's what I'm thinking is happening. And so yeah, the your state uh, Supreme Court has ultimate jurisdiction over the practice of law in your state. And long story short, that's what I'm going to try to do is to take it to the state supreme court but not to the clerk that you would think of go to the common law court crier or marshal or whomever and you'll know who this is if you were to watch a video of the supreme court when they come into the um to do their thing the guy with the gavel isn't one of the justices and the guy with the gavel is the judge the judge gets the gavel Right? Well, none of the justices have the gavel. It's the guy sitting on the end. And in Michigan, he's called the court crier. And court crier is definitely a common law office. So it's the same as, you know, saying a bailiff or a common law sheriff or the, um, it could be an administrative judge or a magistrate judge, excuse me, magistrate judge. Because really, that's what that guy's doing in that case. He's a magistrate judge. He's the the Supreme Court is a jury. They're going to try the facts. He's the judge to execute whatever the jury determines. And so um, he has a different book. And I believe that the Supreme Court of your state is actually the federal district court for the, like mine's the District of Michigan. Yes, it's been split for judicial purposes, but I don't need it for judicial purposes. I need it for its administrative purposes to administer the law as it applies to um, crimes against the people of the United States. And that you would do it, that the plaintiff is the United States of America, and you are the ex-rel plaintiff, and that way there isn't any cost for the 
action because the United States of America is the uh, plaintiff. You're just the narrator. But you can see here, right? So if this is the, what they would have filled out. So um, as part of getting a license and just passing the test, it's you know that's just part of it. Then they have to do a background test, and that's what or background check and these other things. And really, they're not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state until they go and they cross the bar and they sign their name in the role of attorneys. And if they have done that, then they are licensed to go before the Supreme Court and uh, argue a case. Well, since most attorneys don't seem to be able to do that, then they're really not licensed to practice law. Then they can't call themselves an attorney because that's what it means when you put in a business card that you're saying you're licensed to practice law. It's all simulated legal process and uh, fictitious names and you know, color of law, and it's all a civil rights violation, which is Title 42, federal law, use that as a basis to go to the Supreme Court, not to the normal clerk that you would think of, but I believe it's to the, um, here he's called a court crier, the common law clerk, because we're trying to get to common law, not to the civil law side. And um, well, we'll see what happens. Now, not only on so not only for this attorney, okay, that's just one thing. But in New York, also, if uh, this is for New York City, so if somebody wants to become a judge in New York City, they have to fill out this questionnaire. And in this questionnaire, it says full name. Have you ever? use or been known by any other name. Well, if they don't put the name of the middle initial they've been using it here, then again, it, it, this is the evidence of their crime. Okay, so um, because, uh, now because of this, and, and because people have tried it, they're going to say, well, we've tried these things before. Well, we haven't necessarily tried going to the Supreme Court, and the basis for that is backed up by the history of English common law that, um, in fact, I'm reading a book on it right now. I was going to do it as part of this video, but it's just too long to put the two together. But um, as far back as uh, King Henry II, which was in the 1100s, 1172 or something like that, there's been one central court right and so the idea was that you would go to the central court and take your complaint the royal court and the royal court would issue a subpoena or a writ or whatever it was to the lower court to the sheriff to whomever to have whoever it was that you're complaining about you know make it right or come to the king's court and tell them why they hadn't and that's the only way that you can go because of the rule of law and what it says in the Magna Carta and then what it says in the Constitution, right, that certain things have to happen. Um, jury of their peers or whatever it is, well, the jury of peers for people with middle initials is the Supreme Court because they're a jury. The justices are a jury. <coughs> Believe it or not. All right. There's so many little things here I got to point out. But so, how this how did this all get so screwy in the first place? Right, let me show you how screwy this is. So here's a public law. 102-14, 102nd Congress, May tw March 20th, 1991, Joint Resolution. Whereas Congress recognizes the historical tradition of ethical values and principles which are the beliefs or which are the basis of civilized society upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. 
Whereas without these ethical values and principles of edifices, civilization stands, serious peril, returning to chaos. Whereas society is profoundly concerned with the recent weakening of the principles has resulted in a crisis of beleaguered and threatened the fabric of civilized society. Whereas justified preoccupation of these crises must not let the citizens of the nation lose sight of their responsibility to transmit these historical ethical values from our distinguished past to the generations of the future. Whereas the Labutich movement has fostered and promoted these ethical values. Yada, yada, yada. At the end of the day, we're going to have a holiday for some Jewish rabbi uh, because he's made it known to everybody that, hey, we're our civilization, right, our nation is founded, according to the Congress, on the seven Noahide laws. So it's not a Christian nation, it's a Talmudic nation. Those are the seven Noahide laws of the Talmud. Well, that's crazy, right? That was in 1991. Again, it's <laughs> Joint Resolution, Public Law, 102.14. says the Noahide laws are the bedrock of our civilization. Well, here's a proclamation from Dwight D. Eisenhower. See, he's the middle initial group. Whereas it is fitting that the people of the of this nation, again, this nation is capitalized. Hey, it was just like the other one, right? So this is the Noahide Law Nation. Whereas it is fitting that the people of the Noahide Law Nation should remember with pride and vigilante, vigilantly, guard the great heritage of liberty, justice, and equality under the law which our forefathers bequeathed to us, and whereas it is our moral and civil obligation as free men, free men, and as Americans to preserve and strengthen the great heritage, free men is from the Magna Carta, to preserve and strengthen the great heritage, and whereas the principle and guarantees fundamental rights of individuals under the law is the heart and sinew of our nation, no high law nation, and distinguishes our governmental system from the type of government rules by might alone, and our government has served as an inspiration and a beacon of light for oppressed peoples of the world seeking freedom, justice, and equality for the individuals under laws and whereas universal application of the principles of the rule of law in settlement of international disputes would greatly enhance the cause of a just and enduring peace. Whereas a day of national dedication to the principles of government under the laws would afford us an opportunity to better understand appreciation manifold virtues of such government and use focus attention on world upon them. Therefore, Dwight Delano, Dwight D, of course, Eisenhower, president of the lowercase United States of America, working for King George, do hereby designate Thursday, May first, nineteen fifty eight, as Law Day. And so May first is Law Day. And just go Google Law Day and you'll see all these people and judges and stuff talking about how great it is and it's about the rule of law and so forth. And every year, um, they put out a proclamation to talk about this Law Day. I think I saved another one. Where's the one that Obama did? He just did one. Right here. That was 1958. Right here's uh, 2015. Throughout the world, the rule of law is a center of promise, central to the promise of safe, free, and just society. Respect and adherence to the rule of law is the premise upon which the United States was founded, and has been a cornerstone of my presidency. America's commitment to the fundamental principle sustains our democracy. It guides our process. It helps to ensure all people receive fair treatment and protects government of, by, and for the people. This Law Day we celebrate a milestone in the extraordinary history of the rule of law by marking the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. Law Day goes back to the Magna Carta. 
Centuries ago, when kings, emperors, and warlords reigned over much of the world, it was this extraordinary document, agreed to by the King of England in 1215, the first spelled out the rights and liberties of man, the ideals for which Magna Carta inspired America's forefathers to define the protections and protect many of the rights expressed in our founding documents, which we continue to cherish today. So if you're from England, we, you'd still be using the, and if you're an English subject, right, you would still be using the rules of law, or I mean Magna Carta. But if you're in the United States of America, then you're under the Constitution, which says there that the um, supreme law of the land is the federal law. But it's the procedure that matters. It's how do you bring the procedure to say that they've done wrong. And you have to go to the king's court. You can't go to the local court. In fact, uh, where is that book? I was going to do a video or add this whole thing to this video, but it's too long. So there's a book called The Birth of the English Common Law written by R.C. Van Canagem and uh, I just want to see if I can quickly find a couple of quotes that I had wanted to point out here we go The steady use of royal writs was remarkable in quantity and for the regularity of their formulas. The use of the vernacular strengthened their national character and was made for close contact with the population. Their text could be directly read out in local courts to assembled communities, a unique feature of the time. No other monarchy disposed of the same means of direct national taxes, nor were the interesting possibilities of frequent uh, dangles Dangelds neglected by William and his uh, successors. English coinage was technically superior. Yada yada yada. Now nowhere was the territorial organization so effective as the network of royal officers headed by royal sheriffs, not the ten star who's who's been um, elected um, locally, but a guy who's been appointed by the sovereign. So in this case, it would be you know, a federal marshal, or an administrative law judge, or a magistrate law judge, or whatever they want to call him. It's just he his office isn't local. His office is an office under the sovereign, the United States of America. He is representing the United States. Oh, uh, those are... The sheriff was the principal officer of the crown, right? So he's a crown officer working for the king, for the sovereign, in the shire, collected the royal revenue, that makes him the tax collector, there, and conducted the judicial business of its court. The Norman kings gave this office to men of considerable importance, Normans, of course, but managed to keep them firmly under control. The practice of the exchequer shows that however big a man the sheriff was in his county, his trembling servant, when he had to render account to his royal masters. Uh, well, there you go, right? So, um, well, and then I think there's just one little thing I want to read here, and then we'll get on to where we're going in this thing. If we are on firm ground with the sheriff, the numerous justices basically appear in great quantity, often fleeting in the filament firmament of 12th century England, are different proposition. The term justice, as it appears in documents of the time, covers a multitude of roles and capacities from the capitalis justicarius of the kingdom, holding vice regal power, well that would be guy who would become known as a chancellor eventually, I think. 
to obscure local justices who are mentioned once or twice in addresses and so forth and so on. The Justicar, the king's alter ego, was the head of the administration and in frequent absence of the king held vice regal power. And so you could easily say, well, that's the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Because he has executive power. He can, he, the, the Supreme Court has a... Uh, can take uh, superintending control over pretty much anything. They don't have to have a court case. They just need to execute the law. And so, are they executing just the state of Michigan law, or are they executing the federal law? Well, I say they have to execute the federal law. And the way you get them to do it is you go to the common law officer, clerk, such as the court crier, because he's got the docket books where the seal is, not the file stamp. The other clerk's got the file stamp. We want the dude with the seal. Okay. Um, hang on just a second here. Okay. Um, this, is one of these, this is one of those videos where it's really not going anyplace in particular except to point out a bunch of things that they all seem to fit together around this one hub, which is the rule of law. And uh, the American Bar Association is deep into it, and they had this little PDF that you can pull off online about the rule of law. Right? Just Google the rule, the rule of law. What makes up the rule of law? So, no free men shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him, nor send upon him, except by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. So first of all, what's a freeman? Right? A lot of people think it's, you know, it's all about us, but they're not. The freeman, that's a very select group of people. It's the royals of England. The ones that had uh, land or some type of office through the king um, could be considered freemen. But most people were considered valines. You know, they were just uh, somebody's property. Well, that's why, you know, that's, that's the first thing. When you see, so like when it says white citizens, it's like, well, that's just a small group of people. It's got nothing to do with me. I may be Caucasian, but I ain't white. I'm not in that group. No freeman shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him nor send upon him except by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. So who's his peers? Well, they're all using middle initial names. And the ones at the top are these guys called the justices of the Supreme Court, and they're using middle initials. And the justice of the Supreme Court, you know, even in your state, they maintain their office um, during good behavior. And here not too long ago, one of the justices on Michigan Supreme Court went to prison for a year, um, being involved in the, you know, the wrong side of a, of a uh, uh, real estate deal. And then, you know, trying to hide it or something, and pff, I got caught. She went to prison. So, yeah, th you know, apparently... They didn't consider her actions good behavior. Uh, so, you know, 1215, King John of England signed the Magna Carta. A group of barons, powerful noblemen, supported the king in exchange for estates and land, demanded that the king sign the charter to recognize their rights. Well, they're the freemen. Article 39 was written to ensure the life, liberty, and property of free subjects of the king could not be arbitrarily taken away. Instead, the lawful judgment of subjects' peers or law of the land had to be followed. Well, again, the Supreme Court, I believe, has the duty to execute the law of the land within the state because it's actually the District of Michigan, lowercase state, federal state, a free and independent republic, um, 
and that's just an execution and then the judgment would be the the judgment of it doesn't say a jury just the judgment of a subject's peers so any one of those people on the Supreme Court can make a judgment and then if the whoever doesn't like it well then they can appeal it to the Supreme Court but you know you need to take your complaint to the Supreme Court and I don't believe you take it to the clerk <laughs> that they make you think it goes to unless he's going to put it under court seal it needs to be sealed it's done like a quiet tam action and actually this is all done XREL where the United States of America will be the plaintiff and you'll be XREL so it'd be the United States of America comma XREL Robert Allen Rutluski comma plaintiff V small v versus whomever it is and the thing about the federal law is it can go against the individual not just this you know down to the individual person to their proper person um, and uh, so more of that in the next video. I'm just trying to put these pieces together to you see where it came from. But, you know, it's all these little pieces from all over the place. But it had to do with the rule of law. So the rule of law says if they're in this click, um, you know, and they have a charter, then you need to, you know, if you're going to come against them, you need to do it the way it says to. And it says to, you know, to go. Um, to this um, well this doesn't say it but what, what it says in the book was to go to the royal court with your complaint and then they will issue a writ hand it down to the judge or the court or whoever it is to have them get you justice otherwise right you've been denied due process okay enough on that Now here's history. This is in Wikipedia. See, this is this is kind of what started this for me a few weeks ago when I read this again. It's like, well, what is it saying? It says the Michigan Supreme Court can be dated back to the Supreme Court of the Michigan Territory, established in 1805 with three justices. We'll stop right there. The Supreme Court of the Michigan Territory, established in 1805, was a military court. Well, it was definitely a federal court. But they were military officers. The governor was a general. And the three judges that wrote in, you know, they, so, you know, the, pretty much what happened is they, the, the day after the great fire of Detroit that burnt up all the records, in comes the horses with the guys who say they're from the federal government and we're here to help, right? We're the new territorial government and Ah, we'll take care of that for you. We'll get it resurveyed and get everybody their deeds, and you know we'll, we'll take care of it. Uh, you know they just got rid of the old records and started over. But nevertheless, Supreme Court of Michigan Territory is a federal court, and this says the Michigan Supreme Court can be dated back to the Supreme Court of the Michigan Territory. Well, then it's a federal court, and in this court the judicial power of the state lowercase state so that is the free and independent state created uh, under the style the state of Michigan is vested exclusively in one court of justice which shall be divided into one supreme court one court of appeals one trial court general jurisdiction one probate court and courts of limited jurisdiction of the legislation established by two-thirds yeah. courts of record seal qualifications to judge the supreme court See, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, so they're talking about this one up here. The Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals, the Circuit Court, the Probate Court, and other courts designated as such by legislature shall be courts of record, and each shall have a common seal. Justices and judges of courts of record must be persons who are licensed to practice law in the state. Okay? have a common seal well this is the seal of the Michigan Supreme Court and this is the seal of what would be called the Court of Appeals of the state of Michigan All right seal of the Michigan Supreme Court 
Court of Appeals of the State of Michigan. They're two different jurisdictions. These aren't common seals. So this can't be the appeal court they're talking about, or this can't be the Supreme Court they're talking about. They're going to have common seals. Now, some crazy history here, right? So go back to the Northwest Ordinance, where it says they're going to split this territory up into three states. However, if they decide later, they can draw an east-west line at the very southern tip of Lake Michigan and create two states to the north side of that, which if they had done that, and they did, would be Michigan and Wisconsin. And below would be Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, right? Um, and so when Michigan first became a territory, its border was east-west line at the bottom of Lake Michigan, which would mean if you carried the line over, eventually it would run into Lake Erie to the east, and everything north would be Michigan. Well, had they done that, Toledo would now be in Michigan. And so there was a big ta-da about that, and so even though they did the Constitution 1835, based on the public survey and the um, Northwest Ordinance, by whatever proper name it is, um, when they became a state of Michigan in 1837, in the middle of the night, on a vote of people who weren't elected to make the vote, they um, they moved the border. And so, you know, just go look at where Michigan is and the Lake Michigan and you know, Chicago did the same thing. Chicago should be in Wisconsin. Everything north of the very southern edge of Lake Michigan should be in Wisconsin or Michigan, and it isn't. And so none of the states have the borders as mandated in the Northwest Ordinance, and so they're really not the states. And anyways, they they had to rush this thing through because Michigan, when they first said it, said no, and they were afraid Michigan was going to go to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court would have found in their favor because, by God, that is what the organic law says that that's the border. And so they pushed something through in the middle of the night, and you know, just hid the evidence. And that's really the way this whole system works. It's all by lie, cheat, steal, omission of material facts, and all sorts of things. But what I can tell you is <laughs> these aren't common seals. And so the seal of uh, Michigan Supreme Court is different than uh, the Court of Appeals of the State of Michigan. They're not the same jurisdiction. Look at some other crazy things. Articles of Confederation, formerly the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. So by becoming, by being accepted under the Articles of Confederation, you automatically join the Union. And they talked about having something to join the Union afterwards, but that isn't what it says. It says, you know, if you become a state, and the Northwest Ordinance said if you become a state, you're under the Articles of Confederation. All states and territories are under the Articles of Confederation. And all that was done when there was only a General Assembly, one, you know, unicarmal Congress. And then they had, uh, they were they were trying to revamp the Articles of Confederation, and they got together, and they came up with a Constitution and a bicarmal Congress. And they wrote a Constitution for United States of America, but not for the United States of America. So here's what it says in the Articles of Confederation. To all those present shall come, we undersigned delegates of the states affix our names, send greeting, Articles of Confederation, and perpetual union between the states, lowercase states, of New York, Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, and Province Plantation, Connecticut. Look, they don't have the same names, right? Rhode Island and Providence Plantations. New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, yada yada. The style of the Confederacy shall be the United States of America. Okay, that's the Articles of Confederation. Now, the definitive Treaty of Peace in 1783, where it said, in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, 
and having pleased divine providence to dispose the hearts of the most serene and most potent King George the Third, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Duke of Brunswick and Lugenburg, Arch Treasurer and Prince Elector of the Holy Roman Empire, etc., and of the United States of America. He's the King of United States of America. Now go look at your passport. United States of America. Right? There's no the in front of it. And your name is backwards. And this is, you know, if, if this is a passport book, then this is the inside cover of the passport book. Now let's go read the book. I've done this in other videos. You guys have seen this before, but I just still blows me right. So, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. So King George is Secretary of State. Hereby request all whom it may concern to permit the citizen national of the United States named herein to pass without delay, hindrance, and in case need give all lawful aid and protection. But there's no one herein named. There should be a name right here, right? This should right here, I believe, should say Robert Allen Rutluski right there. And it doesn't. And I always, you know, when I was traveled a lot, you'd look at these guys, look at passports, they just flip them open and close it, and really they're just looking to see, <laughs> I think, is your name in here? And it wasn't. But this United States of America, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, isn't the same jurisdiction as the national, citizen national of the United States. Again, United States is an abbreviation for the United States of America, the style of the Confederation. United States of America is what King George is the king of. And what did he say? Uh, His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States. So he acknowledges the United States of America. Viz. What are they? New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, Providence Plantation, Connecticut, New York. Same thing. To be free and independent states, that he treats them as such, and for himself, his heir, heirs and successors, relinquishes all claims to the government, propriety, and territorial rights of the same and every part thereof. Of the United States of America. But he's still the king of United States of America, and by God, that's where they got me, in the United States of America. And while I was there, they took my Social Security. Where it says, so this is the front of this, this is the stub that's attached to a Social Security card. Detach this portion from the upper half of the card and keep it in a safe place. Hey, I did do that. Your name and Social Security account number appear on the other side. Your name and social security account number appear on the other side. Well, when I looked at it, it <laughs> they're saying my name is Robert A. Rutluski. Well, that isn't my name. But they put it as the owner of this social security account and clouded the title and threw me into the jurisdiction of King George III and his successors. Under the Constitution and under the justices which are supposed to be over the democracy and I'm supposed to be over here in the Republic telling them what to do. So anyways, you know, they this is how they steal your account. They just put it in a, they make an error or an omission in the permanent record and it doesn't show that you're the owner. It shows this dude Robert A. Rutluski is the owner. Well that name isn't registered anywhere. But I did use it here. What the fuck was I thinking? Because that's the way, the way I was taught in the Army, I guess. I think we use middle initials in the Army. I have to go back and look. Okay, I need just a second here. Okay, hey, I kind of lost my place. In fact, I've started and stopped a video two or three times today, and I'm not really sure what I said in one and what I didn't say in another. So 
Did I point this site out? It's called uh, www.com-and-here.com. Comeinhere.com. Um, so probably if you just Google comeinhere.com, you'll end up here. And this will tell you a lot about uh, the fact that there are people who say, hey, we're under the Noahide laws. Whether you like it or not, or what you believe, doesn't matter. Right? We're under the Noahide laws. And uh, they had this thing here with the article with Scalia. Now, this is from 2002, so you know it doesn't have anything to do with what just happened. Don't really know what happened. Um, but a uh, Supreme Court judge is said to be a, fa a devout Catholic with a fascination of Jewish law. Under circumstances that are not explained, Justice Scalia developed a correspondence with Rabbi Nosen Gure, a discipline of the late Rabbi somebody Shenson Shens Shenserson Schneerson Schneerson I'm going to say Schneerson during the exchange, Scalia mentioned his fascination with Jewish law, and that prompted the rabbi to found an institute. Uh, the institute promotes courses on Talmudic-based law in American law schools and other wise injects Talmud-based law into American society. There you go. We're going to get you. You click that thing, it's going to take you to a little letter that was in the Jewish Week serving the Jewish community of Greater New York, where it said, 12-6-2002, uh, Jewish law comes to D.C. What does the Talmud have to say about legal and moral controversies in modern America? Plenty, according to the creators of a new Washington-based National Institute for Juridic Law, which opened with lavish Supreme Court dinner last month. And that is, you know, the United States Supreme Court. Some Orthodox activists say they can't figure out exactly the point, the whole thing, but Norson Gurry, a rabbi who came up with the idea and won backing from some top Jewish legal experts, harbors no doubts. It will be an eye opener for judges, scholars, law students. He told the Jewish Week, before you know where you're going, you need to know where you come from. And Jewish law is the basis of our legal system in America. So say the Jew. Right? You are under Talmudic law, whether you like it or not. But, of course, that isn't what the Constitution says. The Constitution says the supreme law of the land is whatever it says it is. And so since they're here, that is the supreme law of the land. But we can't use it against those who want to bring uh, Talmudic law against us unless we go to their peers, which are the justices sitting there in the black robes, and tell them. That's how I think it works. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? So the reason I, and because it's the Michigan Supreme Court, I've been looking at some of their rules and so forth, and the Supreme Court clerk appointment, general provisions, uh, clerk who shall keep an office in Lansing under the directions of the court, keep the, you know, lowercase clerk's office, whatever that means. Where the term clerk appears in the subchapter without modification, it means a Supreme Court clerk. I wrote to them here recently, and I got a response from clerk, comma, Michigan Supreme Court. Well, that's not the same as Supreme Court clerk. The clerk may not practice law other than as a clerk while serving as a clerk. The clerk shall perform the following duties. And this is where I, So this is where I am with them now. I've asked them for this bond. Provide me the bond pursuant to your Supreme Court rule 7.301, Organization Operation of Supreme Court, because they had to furnish a bond. The bond must be in favor of the people of the state and the penal sum of 10000 approved by the Chief Justice. Well, show me the money. Well, show me the bond. Um, Supreme Court crier. 
will appoint a crier. The, the crier shall have charge of the Supreme Court room, have charge of the Supreme Court courtroom. Well, that would make him the presiding judge. And the offices and other rooms assigned to the Supreme Court justice have the power to serve in order, process, writ issued by the Supreme Court, collect the fee for service allowed by law for, to sheriffs, deposit monthly with state treasurer all fees collected securing receipt of them. So he has the power to serve in order, process, or a writ issued by the Supreme Court. What well, didn't say the process had to be issued by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court issues the writ. He has a duty to serve the process and the process starts by me giving him a complaint. It's the first step of the process. It's just, you know, who's going to be the plaintiff? Uh, jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Mandatory review. Shall review judicial tenure commission uh, recommending discipline, removal, retirement, suspension. Discretionary. Review by appeal. Cases appending to the appeals court. Review appeal final order of the attorney discipline board. Issue an advisory uh, opinion. Respond to a certified question. Exercise superintendent control over a lower court or tribunal. Exercise other jurisdiction as provided by the Constitution or by law. So what's the other jurisdiction? And I believe the other jurisdiction is the federal jurisdiction. Well, State Bar of Michigan. The State Bar of Michigan is an association of members of the bar of this state organized and existing as a public corporate, corporate as a body public corporate pursuant to powers of the Supreme Court over the bar of the state. So what is that saying? They're a body corporate, so they're a corporation. The members of an association of the state organized and existing. So they're organized and now they're existing as a body public corporate pursuant to the powers of the Supreme Court over the bar of the state. The state bar shall, under these rules, aid in promoting improvements in administration of justice, advancements. Well, that's what they should do, but they're not doing a very good job. Um, those persons, so those persons who are licensed to practice law in this state shall constitute membership of the State Bar of Michigan. So they got to be licensed to practice law. To be licensed to practice law, their name has to be written in the role of attorneys. Subject to the provision of these rules, law students may become law student section members of the State Bar. None other than a member's correct name shall be entered upon the official register of attorneys of the state. That's the thing they call the role of attorneys. Nothing other than the member's correct name shall be entered upon the official register of the attorneys of the state. Each member upon admission to the state bar and in annual due statements must provide the state bar with the member's correct name and address and such additional information as may be required. The name and address on file with the state bar at the time shall control in any matter arising under these rules involving the sufficiency of notice to a member or the proprietary of the name used by the member in practice of law or in a judicial election or in an election of any other public office. In other words, to be a judge in Michigan you have to be elected criteria is you have to be licensed to practice law. So the name that's on the roll would be the name that they would have to use as a judge. But they don't. They use a middle initial. Well, therefore they're not elected. And as it turns out, they don't have a certificate of election. They don't have a proper oath, a proper bond. They don't have any of that stuff. It's all make-believe. It's just we need to go um, somewhere other than to the disciplinary board or the anything to do with the state bar because they're not doing anything but the state bar is under the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over them and all the lower courts and tribunals and so a tribunal would be like uh, your township board meeting they make up a court 
it's a tribunal. In fact, a lot of times I think the dude's got a gavel, doesn't he? He's the judge. Who's got the gavel? Okay, uh, grab a few more things, then we're just about done with this. Hang on a second here. Okay, so we looked at this before. The style of Confederacy shall be the United States of America. Okay, now this is the Constitution of Michigan of 1835, the very first Constitution. It's preamble. We, the people of the Territory of Michigan, as established by Act of Congress of the 11th of January in the year of the Lord, uh, 85. 805, in conformity to the fifth article of the ordinance providing for the government of the territory of the United States, northwest of the River Ohio, believing that time has arrived when our present political condition ought to cease and the right of self-government be asserted, and availing ourselves of that provision of the aforesaid ordinance, of the Congress of the United States of the 13th of July 1787 and acts of Congress pass in accordance with therewith which entitle us to admission into the Union upon condition which has been fulfilled do by our delegates in convention assembled mutually agree to form ourselves into a free and independent state by the style and title of the the state of Michigan, and do ordain and establish the following constitution for the government of the same. There you go. The, <laughs> this 1835 constitution says they're going to be called the state of Michigan, and whatever the criteria was has already been fulfilled, so it's already done. We're now a free and independent state, the Republic of Michigan, called the title of which is the style uh, the state of Michigan. Uh, supremacy clause the United States Constitution established that the Constitution federal laws made pursuant to it and treaties made under its authority constitute the supreme law of the land. It provides that state courts are bound by the supreme law in case of conflict between federal and state law. So take them the frickin' federal law. The federal, right, because this is lowercase state, right? Where did it say? State court. And, you know, this here is lowercase state. The state of, where, 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 the free and independent state, lowercase state. It provides the lowercase state courts are bound by the supreme law in case of conflict between federal and state law. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And so, by rule of law, the supreme law of the land now just became the federal law. And so, that's the law you have to use against the freemen, the law of the land, according to the Magna Carta. Article 3 of the Constitution, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And I believe that's what the Michigan Supreme Court is. It's the District of Michigan Supreme Court. It was one of the first things the Judiciary Act did in 1789. An act to establish judicial courts of the United States Right again, of the United States. You know, this is the United States of America. This is the Republic. So we're going to create some courts for the Republic. And it said, and is further enacted that there be a court called the District Court in each of the aforesaid districts to consist of one judge who will reside in the district for which he is appointed and shall be called a district judge and shall hold annually four sessions. Yada, yada, yada. But what they did is they took the states, so in, in two, that the United States shall be and hereby are divided into 13 districts. That the United States shall be and hereby are divided into 13 districts to be limited and called as follows, to wit, one, to consist of that part of the state of Massachusetts which lies easterly of the state of New Hampshire. 
and be called the Maine District. One consists of the state of New Hampshire and be called the New Hampshire District. Right? Not the state of. Right? Again, this, <coughs> this the state of New Hampshire is different than the state of New Hampshire. So they created districts. And they did the same thing in Michigan. They When they passed the Constitution at the same time in Congress, in fact, I had a copy of it someplace, they passed an act to provide to turn Michigan into a district. And since then, it's been split for judicial purposes into two districts. But I don't need it for judicial purposes. I need it to execute the law. So the, there's one district judge who has two districts that he's the judge of. But uh, this, you know, this makes it sound like there's one judicial judge, one federal judge, and I don't know that it's the justices. I believe it's an officer of the court, other than the justices. But it's definitely an officer of the court, and you know, it's the court crier, or it's the court clerk, or it's the common law clerk, or it's some name like that but it's not over at the district court for the Western District of Michigan that's an inferior court these courts are article 3 courts they're the inferior courts they talked about in the um, in the Constitution Right? The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. I'm going to say they established the court that I call the Michigan Supreme Court and that they have jurisdiction in uh, federal law. Okay, so how do you do all this? Let's see here. So I was looking at some of the... Um, like a QTAM, right, where you're an XRL plaintiff, because the United States is actually the plaintiff, the United States of America. But when you do it under, when you go and look on your state Supreme Court site and you see them using a state law that talks about QTAM, because they'll let you do it under state law, they say, you have to have first hand knowledge, right? You can't use a record or, um, something under seal or a contract or anything else you know you have to have first-hand knowledge of the event but when I was reading this one particular case they had this section in that I just pulled up when I hear we did however recognize in Cleveland Cliffs that persons bringing Kwai Tam actions were found to have standing by the United States Supreme Court in Vermont Agency of Natural Resources versus United States XREL Stevens which is 529 US 765 on and on and on. We stated, accordingly, the Vermont Agency Court held that one who brings a realtor suit has standing because he is the assignee of a claim and may assert the injury in fact suffered by the assignor, which is normally the government. And the government is the United States of America. In such cases, the court concluded the government injury in fact suffices to confer standing on the individual realtors bringing the suit. That's why you can do it under federal law and not under state law because the federal court said you can and the state courts agreed. The use of citizen suits or actions by private attorney generals does not undermine the application of traditional standing requirements. If anything, the use of such suits supports the application of those requirements as citizen suits and actions by private attorney generals have always been grounded in private injury, whether suffered directly or a result of an assignment by another. So when somebody harms you, they've disturbed the king's peace. The king is the United States of America. It's common law. Anytime that any, any crime starts with disturbing the peace. In some, uh, Cleveland Fist holds the legislature may not confer standing on a party that does not otherwise meet the constitutional injury, in fact, test for standing. But under Vermont agency, the legislature may create quietam actions. Okay. And what does quietam mean? It's an abbreviation for Latin phrase that means who pursues this action 
on our Lord the King's behalf as well as his own. There you are, right? You're bringing a you're bringing evidence of a crime to the attention of those who have a duty to enforce the law. In common law, writ equitam is a writ whereby a private individual who assists a prosecution can receive all or part of the penalty imposed. The name is abbreviation for the Latin phrase, meaning he who sues this matter for the king as well as for himself. The writ fell into disuse in England and Wales following the Common Informers Act of 1951. Doesn't mean it isn't there, but remains current in the United States and is still current in England and Wales. You need to find the court that has the justices, the high court, find the clerk, accept his oath, bind him to it, run him as a fiduciary duty, get him in his common law hat, and then point out a crime. And let him do it. Uh, okay. XREL is an abbreviation of Latin phrase ex relatio, meaning arising out of the relation narration of the realtor. The term is a legal phrase. The legal citation guide, the blue book, describes XREL as a procedural phase and requires using the abbreviation on the relation of, for the use of, on behalf of, and similar expressions. So it's a procedural phrase, right? It's part of the procedure. You need to put it in your paperwork, XREL. And so, uh, you know, one that I saw was, uh, I don't remember what the, how they did it exactly. But it seems to me that the plaintiff is the United States of America, comma, XREL, you are the relator, comma, that's the plaintiff, you speaking for the, on behalf of the king, versus whoever it is, that you're going after or is causing the problem be it a man or be it a legal person or whatever it is um, and because the plaintiff is the United States of America well it doesn't cost anything to put it in you're not opening a court case you're pointing out a crime you're just putting in a complaint they're going to open the court case they'll have to determine if they need to have a jury involved or make a judgment of their peers or show them the law that's been violated and say that's the supreme law of the land and now you need to enforce it. Such as, you know, a false statement. Federal law, false statement. That would be uh, 18 U.S.C. 1001. And the omission of a material fact is a false statement. So the fact that they don't use their full name is a, an omission of a material fact and therefore it's a false statement. Oh. My daughter told me dinner's ready. I gotta get this done. And the most commonly used uh, when government brings a cause of action upon request of a private party who has some interest in the matter. The private party is called the realtor. In such case, the government acts on the basis of narration or recounting of the alleged facts by the relator. So you're going to relate the facts, and the government's going to bring the case. Governments typically accept applications and commence litigation for XREL action only if the interest advanced by the private party is similar to the interest of the government. Well, of course it is. But the thing about um, XREL is it has to be under seal. And when you take something to the clerk, they just put it under file. They don't put it under seal. Right? This is the difference between a file stamp of a clerk and a seal of a court. Um, in fact, I don't think it was in here. I had this whole thing and I took it out. But uh, basically, you can do it on the False Claims Act. That's one way to do it. But you could do it with Title 42. Right now, this is real interesting. So, 42 U.S.C. 1987, prosecution of violation of certain laws. The United States attorneys, lowercase attorney. So this isn't the office called the United States Attorney. This is somebody who's representing the United States. Right? They don't have to be an attorney at law, just an attorney. I can be an attorney. I can't be a counselor at law, but I can be an attorney. 
right? You give me power of attorney, I can go act for you. So the United States attorneys, marshals, deputy marshals, and the United States magistrate judges appointed by the district or territorial courts, either one, either you're in a district because your state is a state or you're still a territory and uh, mine goes back to 1805, it's what it says in the frickin' Wikipedia. That's public record. With power to arrest, imprison, to bail or bail offenders, and every other officer who is specially empowered by the president are authorized and required at the expense of the United States to institute prosecutions against all persons violating any of the provisions of section 1990 of this title or section 5506 to 5516, 5518, 5532 of the revised statutes and to cause such person to be arrested and imprisoned and bailed for trial before the court of the United States or the territorial court having cognizance of the offense. And so this revised statute, we've seen to me you had to go look at those and they were, you know, old forms. This like Library of Congress I had to go find them. And it has to do with you being disenfranchised of your ability to register to be a qualified elector to vote and this goes back to because we are not on the proper assessment roll we don't know that we're supposed to pay a poll tax road impact fee or whatever it is and because we don't pay it well then we don't get to vote because we don't have the receipt to show to let us go and vote Uh, well, all that stuff is covered in here. This is all, you know, what they're pointing out in here are things to do with your civil rights. But it's just saying they have a duty. So I'm going to copy, my, my thinking is I'm going to copy and paste this and put it right in the very beginning of my paper that I'm sending to the Supreme Court clerk for them to go find who fits this bill and give it to them. And I need to go look at this, these sections again and figure out which ones I'm going to use. But that's a powerful freaking law right there. Action for neglect to prevent every person who, having knowledge that any of the wrongs conspired to be done and mentioned in 18, 1985 of this title, are about to be committed and having power to prevent or an aid in preventing the commission of the crime, neglect to refuse to do so, and if such wrongful act be committed, shall be liable to the party injured or his legal representatives for all damages caused by such wrongful act. Jeepers, that's good. Well, what are they talking about? Well, what is 1985? Conspiracy to interfere with civil rights. So two or more persons in any state or territory conspire to prevent by force, intimidation, or threat any person from accepting or holding an office, trust, or place of confidence under the United States or from discharging the duties thereof. All right, so you have the office of elector. And they're, they're not letting you hold it. You should be an elector. That's an office. It's the highest office in the in the land. Right, just go look at a uh, organization chart, right? And the electors or the citizens or whatever they call them, they're on top of everybody else. Right, that's an office. It's above the office of mayor. It's above the office of president. It's above the office of governor. It's above them all. Obstructing, obstructing justice. Well, this is where we get them. If two or more persons in any state or territory conspire to deter by force, intimidation, threat, or any party, or witnesses in any court of the United States from attending such court or from testifying to any matter pending therein freely, fully, truthfully, and this is what they do to you because they never, you never, we never appear in the proper court, the one with the seal. We appear in the court with the stamp, which is a fictitious court. Civil action for deprivation of rights. Every person who under color of law of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage, or any state or territory of District of Columbia subjects or causes to be subjected any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof 
So if you're within the territorial boundaries of the of the United States of America, which you are if you're here in you know on this continent, um, well, in the boundaries they say, right, the 50 states, then this applies. Canada, you're going to have your own thing, but it's going to be the same. Go find the justices and, you know, we just got to find the right clerk and, and it's common law. And in common law, the only way that the freemen have to answer is it has to be because it's been taken to the higher court and then it goes down to them. That's where we started this crazy ass thing. This hour long ago, I was t started talking. Uh, okay, but then there's one other really, really good one. Well, there's a lot of good ones, but how about this one? Equal rights under the law. Section 1981, equal rights under the law. All persons, all persons, what, what, how many? All of them, within the jurisdiction of the United States, shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties, give evidence, and to the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as is enjoyed by white citizens. Whatever that means. Right? As enjoyed by freemen is what I'm saying. And shall be subjected to like punishment, pains, penalties, taxes, license, extractions of every kind and to no other. Well, this is, we're not being allowed this. We're, this is the due process we're not being allowed because we're not being allowed to give evidence. We're not being allowed to appear in our proper person, right? So we can't be a party. Yada, yada, yada. And so it is civil rights violations. Those are federal laws. They're the supreme law of the land. And every state has a place to deal with it, and I just think it's the Supreme Court. Because it, it hasn't appeared to be these other courts where people try to put in Title 42 actions and stuff. Right? It's not the right court. The, the, it's justices, not judges. We're looking for justices. We're looking for a court of justice, not a court of law. And so I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, i got lots of holes to fill in on this later, but I just wanted to get some of this off of my out of my head basically because I want to go write my piece of paper I need to write and send it in so with that in mind I'm gonna leave it here and you all have a good night if you can please do um, please do donate if you can't donate well go down and put something in the court and see what happens so we get this stuff over with see ya